I will talk a bit about superharmonics, fairly general, trying to put the area in perspective, give a general overview on the status, and also give a bit of an idea of our university, the group we are working in, and the kind of subjects we're working in. Um, we are located in, well, our university is Lulio University of Technology, with the main, uh, the main campus in Lulio, 65 degrees north. Um, there's not much of night time here at this time of year, as you, can, as you may imagine. However, we are slightly further south in Galeftio, which is still far north for most of you, I guess. Um, this is our group. We have uh, 2.25 associate or full professors, uh, assistant professors. The distinction between associate full professors and other people with a PhD is important because as a associate professor or full professor, you are allowed to have the main responsibility for the supervision of PhD students. And that's important because we have 16 PhD students at the moment. We also run a bachelor program in power engineering, three years power engineering, 90 students, about 30 per year. And it's been distance, and not only the last few months, we actually have been doing distance education since 2010. We have collaboration between two universities spread through the northern Sweden, which made it easier to do it by distance. Our students are spread through the country and sometimes even spread over the world. Um, what our driving force is, well, adapting the grid to a sustainable energy system, that's quite a lot of power engineering group do, doing. Performing world leading research, we try to recruit the best people. That's our aim to which extent we succeed is always difficult to say, that's more up to you. But also we want to maintain knowledge. We not just want to work on the things that are at this moment fashionable, we also want to maintain knowledge. Actually, we started working on harmonics, super, what is now called superharmonics, in 2004. At the moment, there was really no interest in such. At that time, voltage dips were very high on the agenda, but we felt that let's start working on something else, just to gain the knowledge and then spread it. And it turned out to work. We also try to build bridges between university theory on one side and industry reality on the other side. That makes it sometimes a bit difficult to, on one hand, try to have to work on things which are relevant to the industry, and on the other hand, performing world leading research and high level publications. We get a reason but balance to that, I hope, and not really end up in the middle of the river, although it's a nice river, I think. Um, what are our research directions? Well, we don't really have specific defined research directions, but these are the four things that we more or less work on. Power quality, quite a lot. Also low and medium voltage distribution. A lot of universities work on transmission systems, but we more work on low and medium voltage. Electricity markets we work on, and even transmission system reliability. I yesterday made a list of some of our non-power quality projects although power quality is to some extent as well coming into the era. Uh, we work on hosting capacity, solar power, electric vehicle charging. We work quite a lot on LED lamps, actually. We learned a lot of super harmonics from looking at LED lamps and uh, other type of lighting. Why did we take lamps? For the very simple reason, it's much cheaper to buy 200 lamps than to build 200 wind turbines. So we worked a lot on lamps and from that we learned things. At a certain moment, some of the phenomena we discovered in an installation with 48 lamps could be directly applied to a wind park. This obviously saved us a lot of money we didn't have to build a wind park. We were in microgrids, we've done measurements for several years on a microgrid with one single customer. And now we work on microgrids with about 2,000 customers. Energy efficient data centers we work on. We work on stochastic models for future transmission grids. Uh, operational risk assessment comes in there, but also um, dynamic line rating. We work on deep learning, machine learning, and we have uh, an interesting, more like a discussion project on what happens with the electricity market when there is only renewable energy, which is for free. So would you still have a market on it? But the main aim of this presentation is to give a brief history of waveform distortion and obviously, you'll realize this history will end up with the future superharmonics. But let's go back to the beginning. We talk here about late 1800s, early 1900s. 
when the system consists of single machines control almost all red lines, and that was it. And actually, those single machines, they produced a lot of harmonics. The building single machines, people didn't think of harmonics, they just divided them, produced the harmonics, and the lines started to resonate. They found out about this one, measuring harmonics in 1895 was a bit of a challenge, but with certain mechanical electrical solutions were managed. And in the end, the solution was made the winding distribution so that harmonic five and seven, the emission is very small, and then a generator transformer that removes the term in the night. And at the same time, the consumption increased, there are more and more components in the grid, and you got more and more time. And in that way, the resonances didn't, the resonances itself didn't disappear, but they were no longer excited that much. And it became them. Things went fine, one can say, until the late 50s when somebody in Sweden invented HVDC and started to produce harmonics. This resulted in the work, in actually in the establishment of an HVDC research group in Manchester. But one of the people working there was somebody called Josh Arilaga. You may be known to many of you. He set up a lot of knowledge on harmonics, generation of harmonics, uh, propagation of harmonics based on the on the emission by HVDC and large industrial lines. This resulted in standards, IEEE 519, the IC6002, E5160 came even later. But a lot of this was based on this work. Best of harmonic filters within the solution. Then came the uh, in, uh, small converters, uh, consumer electronics. Suddenly, everybody wanted their mini HVDC link and called it a television. We, initially, it was second harmonics, well, let's see, second harmonics in the UK, but not in France. Don't ask me why. Uh, the television peak. The main emission was at 6, 7, 8 in the evening when people watched that. The solutions here, the requirement on equipment emission. It was realized that you cannot do a test and a study for everybody who connects a television. You need to put requirements on emission before that, the real manufacturer before that. So IC6003 took in. Passive power, power factor correction came in, and active power factor correction came in some of data to get the emission below this level. By the way, the television peak has now pretty much disappeared. There's actually an, an office peak at daytime in many cities. Then came capacitor banks. Capacitor banks' aim was voltage control, compensation of reactive power, and suddenly this fifth and seventh harmonic that was so nicely reduced by the active and passive power factor correction, start to be amplified the conductors. Um, several locations in Europe, the fifth harmonic started to get close to the compatibility. And several solutions, one was actually to blame all electronics equipment. There were several papers that showed high levels of fifth and seventh harmonic and associated that with large numbers of power electronics. And yes, the highest level were indeed in the evening, and people were, were having the television. But the main issue was maybe not the emission, but the fact that there was amplification. Uh, there were even attempts made to increase the compatibility tuning of, of the capacitor bank or detuning of the capacitor bank, that was solutions. Um, and also here, because of the blame on the power electronics equipment. There came even harder pushing for emission limits, especially for harmonic five. Um, LED lamps, compact fluorescent lamps, there has been a lot of discussion on reducing the emission in order to avoid the fifth harmonic resonance. This solved itself to a large extent because equipment less and less produces reactive power. So, so it consumes reactive power. So you don't need this capacitor bands that much. But it's still an issue. Then power quality monitoring came up. Not really a problem, but one discovered things. By about 1990, these monitors came available and they're very expensive. 
I remember buying two of them myself uh, in 1998, second hand, but still very expensive. A few years later, uh, they were completely outdated. And by then, C1430 has come up, 2003, the first edition. And suddenly, you no, no longer needed to know about power quality to build an instrument. You just would take the stand. But also, you no longer needed to develop the algorithms they were understanding. And that resulted in a number of cheap instruments. It was not just the standard that they did, because electronics developed a lot as well, measurement technology developed a lot as well, and digital signal processing and such. Um, it resulted in a lot of power quality measurement data, and it put power quality really back on the agenda. Not so much driven by interference, by problems, but more by the possibility to actually start measuring. It was much easier to, to measure somewhere and say, it is indeed a power quality problem. And what in that sense one would work on. But it put a bit of a barrier to innovation. Uh, pretty much all the work on alternative algorithms, alternative indices was stopped because there was a standard. Why would you need alternative? Whether that is good or bad, I don't want to go into that discussion. But Developments continued, and actually, it became also possible to measure well beyond the same. Um, obviously, buying a standard instrument, one could not measure much beyond the standard. But several of the somewhat more advanced instruments, typically quite a lot more expensive as well, actually, you could measure different things. You could change settings, you could do waveform capture and such. And in that way, you could measure beyond the standard and go further. And that was about the situation in 2004. It started to come up at that time, the measurement technology. And that's when we started work on superharmonics. Superharmonics, of course, we didn't invent them. We might have discovered them, we didn't really invent them. Um, active power factor correction was an issue. Other power electronic converters, they produce a beautiful sign. Until you start looking beyond two kilohertz and you realize, no, it's not such a beautiful sign. There is a ripple on it, it's high frequency emission. Um, those ether converters that are cheap or small or light, and at this moment, I guess it's cheaper to have an active power factor correction than to have a tight rectifier and such. So it's cheaper. Those frequencies you come up. Solutions here proposals for emission limits. Trying to learn more about it. That's what we are working on. At least we, we, we do our best. Or keep it secret. It may sound strange, but yes, there are still attempts to push down superharmonics as something that doesn't even exist. I think I'll come back to that one soon. But first, the name superharmonics. Um, it's not me who invented it. It is actually what it turns out. It seems to be Alexandra von Mayer who managed to Alex McKenna. The name superharmonics may be a good thing. Alex mentioned it during a panel session at the general meeting in 2003. And Sarah Runbeck was there. And afterwards, she said to me, I think we have a name. Since then, we have been started using it. Alex for, told me he has forgotten that he mentioned that name or he simply denies it. But the name is there. And I think we should credit Alex and Alexander for that. Some misconceptions. Superharmonics are not harmonics. Yes, linguistically, superharmonics could be harmonics, but they're not. In the same way as interharmonics are not harmonics. Supra is Latin for it means beyond. In other words, they are beyond the harmonics. We use the word harmonics up to 2 kilohertz, as well as interharmonics up to 2 kilohertz. And above 2 kilohertz, we call it superharmonics. We cut off at 150 kilohertz. The reason there is more legal because that's where the radio interference starts. And there are quite a lot of standards starting at 150 kilohertz. So you don't really have to look at that region. Uh, the 250 kilohertz barriers, they are fairly arbitrary. There is not really a change in character at those frequencies. And a criticism on the term superharmonic is often that, well, you need a classification based on origin of the emission, on character of the emission, on impact of the emission. I 100% agree with that, but it's not there. Actually, the 
intraharmonics. There are a lot of different origins of intraharmonics, a lot of different impacts of intraharmonics. Still, we all call it intraharmonics. So I think we should just keep the word superharmonics anyway. Um, working group activities, quite a lot actually. Yeah. The, the word on superharmonics started, in fact, in standardization before the research field picked up. Uh, it was a bit of a spin-off of the emphasis on smart grid standards uh, some years ago, where uh, polar communication was a lot considered to be in the frequency range 9 to 95 kilohertz, which is super harmonic range. Several CGRA working groups working on it, uh, IEC, Cinelec, recently I think 519 has taken out the circuit as well. Research came up somewhere 2014. Now, this is publications using the term superharmonics. Research on that was done before, but the term came up. There was one in 2013, 2019 at uh, almost 140. Until we explore, the orange one came somewhat later. Journal papers, not that much yet. And why? Well, actually, this is what some of the anonymous reviewers say about superharmonics. It's not a problematic subject. Neither academia nor industry is ever asking that. This frequency range is never problematic. Uh, it is seen as controversial. Um, as an engineer, I would be careful about insufficiently substantiated claims. It reminds me a lot about the world on voltage dips when I started that one in the 1990s. A lot of network operators actually didn't want research on it. One of them even, unfortunately, joked, said we should actually pay you for not doing it. Actually, these are some, some, some statements from a few years ago. This reviewer has not seen a proliferation of superharmonics in practice. Another one says it's questionable that superharmonics are general constraints. Luckily, there are also reviewers that say that clear evidence of superharmonics should be studied. Clear indicated further need for research, etc. Starting point for related research. We also get these kind of comments. But there are a lot of reviewers that don't want us to work on super harmonics, but I think we should do it anyway. Especially a lot of cases of interference. I pointed over what coffee. One of the malfunctions that was reported was a coffee maker that made tea. Now, I myself am a tea drinker, so I don't really see the problem. But it seems to be a problem to a lot of people that a coffee maker doesn't make coffee that needs to be. There are a lot of other less relevant things like uh, industrial insulation, shutting down, and things like that. But superharmonics do cause interference. There are quite a lot of cases of emission superharmonics that cause problems. Uh, dimming of lamps. Uh, lamps start to flicker or they don't, they, they're not dimmable. Audible noise is a thing that comes up most, actually, is most important. Medical equipment that doesn't work also seems to be very important. Uh, some years ago, we did a paper, a position paper on it. Sarah Runbeck was leading the one, and a whole team of people working on it. She did made the main contribution. And there we identified a number of subjects where more research was done emission propagation, interference, measurement, standardization, modern simulation. And I made a bit of an overview here. What is the status of the work in these, kind, in these six points? Concerning emission, um, primary emission is reasonably understood. There are quite a lot of papers where measurements are done in the superharmonic range. But there is a phenomenon called secondary emission, which basically means that the device attracts emission from other devices. And if you measure at the interface between the device and the grid, you see a combination of primary emission and secondary emission. And it's not always obvious what is what. Or can actually mathematically prove that or not can distinguish between them. So that's a bit of a challenge for an engineer. Um, also, the background fault is impacts the primary emission, which is not a phenomenon that is known. It is known that it does it, but actually mapping it and modeling it is very complicated. There is something called zero crossing oscillations, which means that somewhere around the zero crossing, the, the bow electronics restart again. 
and causes an oscillation. Because it wants to start phase between it typically gives oscillations. And those oscillations are in the lower kilohertz range. Not that much done about in the research, actually. Propagation, the mathematics, the modeling is relatively simple, but we need measurements, we need models, we need case studies. And we especially found out that resonance is all the time. We actually thought when we started this work, we first did it normally and then we tried to create resonances. But the resonances found us in no time. The resonances, you don't have to look for resonances, they are there everywhere all the time. Which means that here in the modeling, the damping is quite important to model. Interference, convincing the skeptics. I think it's very important from a research viewpoint to keep on emphasizing there is case of interference well-documented case of interference. Measurements, not easy, can be done. Mapping the existing levels is important to show they're actually there. Standardization, actually here, the standardization is going much, much faster than the research, which could be a bit of a problem because the standards may do standardize things which are actually not correct or not correct. We're trying to catch up. And then the modeling and simulation issue where I mentioned it. Now, our super one is a big problem. Question I often get asked. Well, I would say that's the wall cost. I mean, put in perspective, hunger in Africa, the, the coffee makers that don't work, or the, the price of the petrol, and energy in India, of course, are much bigger problems than super one is. It's not if I would say you have to work on one circuit and power engineering only, superharmonics is not the first one. No, I agree. But there are sufficient issues to start looking at. And if we don't do anything about if we don't do anything about superharmonics, there won't be any standards, there won't be any research, any knowledge. There will become more and more unsolved problems. And to be able to solve those, we have to create knowledge, we have to start understanding. And that's why we need research, basically. And obviously for us, it's a big problem because we have to develop things on that one. Knowledge. Conclusions. Superharmonics exist. A lot of studies have confirmed initially. There's no way of denying there are levels of superharmonics and they can solve them. They do spread, certainly through low voltage, Actually, we did a paper several years ago, maybe 10 years ago already, where we showed that a lot of the superharmonic emission stays within the insulation. Yes, true, but some of it co occurs out as well. And if you have one individual device, there is no insulation to absorb. Likely medium voltage as well. If you start to have large solar power plants, for instance, at medium voltage, you will get emission there. Even HVDC light. VSC HVDC produces superharmonics which are spread even for this reason. Cause of interference, too many to neglect. In other words, research is needed. As input to standardization, as a base for spreading knowledge, and to assess how severe is this problem actually. So, thank you very much, my side. Um, I will give the word to Angela. Thank you, Matt, for this uh, very nice overview on, on our research done at uh, Lulea and also on superharmonics. I think it's very good to see the importance of uh, future research on this topic. And I think today we'll, we will have more researchers talking about this. Uh, and to start with Angela. So, uh, Angela, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this presentation about the research on the propagation of superharmonics at Lulea University of Technology in Schulefteo. My name is Angela Spindelgado, and first I'm going to talk about a little bit about myself. So I come originally from Colombia, where I did my, my bachelor's and my master's degree in electrical engineering. Uh, I did it in Bogota in the capital city. And two years ago, I moved to this beautiful city in the north of Sweden called Trilefteo. So right now I am working on my doctoral studies in Lula University of Technology. And my project is about uh, pro uh, propagation of superharmonics. So the motivation for this project is the fact that 
our need for more for the efficient use of electricity has led to a proliferation of devices and systems that uh, that inject superharmonics into the in, into the system devices such as those interfacing between renewable energies and electrical grid electric vehicles smart metering devices energy efficient devices all of them are sources of superharmonics and the more sources of superharmonics we connect into the grid, then more and more pro problems uh, start happening. So we know we uh, need to have more knowledge about this uh, uh, about these levels of superharmonics we are injecting into the grid. We need to have a reference and uh, references to be able to decide if certain if certain levels are high or low. We need knowledge uh, to be able to assess how much how much are the levels of superharmonics seen in the point of common coupling, for example, as we are connecting more and more sources to the system. And we also have uh, need more knowledge about what certain levels of superharmonics mean in terms of certain interference. So that's what drives this this research. The definition of superharmonics, as you have already seen, is waveform distortion in the range 2 to 150 kilohertz. And I'm going to show you an example for you to see how they look like. In time domain, if we look at the current waveform, we can clearly see here a high frequency ripple, high frequency distortion, that it stays for a certain interval and then it disappears. If we want to see this on the frequency domain, then we get this spectrum over the superharmonic range. And we can see that the most of the emission is, lo is located about the 50 kilohertz for this device. Uh, so the frequency domain gives us uh, some idea of the magnitude of the superharmonics, but it doesn't give information about when it disappears and when it is uh, present there during the uh, during a cycle of the fundamental. Now I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit of the of the re uh, about the research that is ongoing on my group on our group in in Lulu University of Technology. And we can, we can divide our approach uh, to superharmonics in our group in two blocks, as you can see here. So one block is taking care of the assessment of superharmonic levels, and another block is taking care of impact of superharmonics on equipment. And one block, the assessment of superharmonic levels, has to do with what to expect at the point of common coupling, as we connect more and more devices that emit superharmonics to the grid. The other block has to do with what characteristics of superharmonics are the problematic ones when talking about interferences. For example, if a light output of LED lamps is varying in such a way that it causes flicker, what is the characteristic of superharmonics that is uh, doing that? Now I am listing some of the topics we are uh, working on at uh, Intraleftel. So this uh, concerns the assessment of superharmonics uh, of superharmonic levels, and we are working in summation of superharmonics in one phase and neutral. We are also working on propagation of superharmonics in low voltage networks in single and three phase framework. We are also studying emission from electric vehicles and their effects on the grid. And on emission, propagation, and consequences of superharmonics in medium voltage networks. For the other block, the impact of superharmonics on equipment, we are studying on. Uh, we, we're studying on how to give indications of severity of superharmonics. So this is what uh, I was talking to you before. What is the characteristic of superharmonic that matters when talking about certain interference? Is it the time behavior of the superharmonics or is it their characteristics in the frequency domain? 
And we are also studying interference of superharmonics on LED lighting and with uh, residual current devices, uh, low voltage protective devices. So now from these two blocks I am presenting to you right now, the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about one of them, the assessment of superharmonic levels and specifically on the propagation of superharmonics. And the question uh, we want to address here is what is the impact of, of impedances in the, in the emission and propagation of superharmonics? And for this matter, we have used this setup. I am going to, for the rest of this presentation, I am going to show you two experiments we did and that will exemplify how superharmonics propagate. So we have this setup in which we have a lighting installation that is homogeneous. That means that we used uh, LED lamps the, of the same type and manufacturer for the, in this installation. And we have a neighboring device and they are connected uh, together at a common point. And the experiment one uh, wants to assess what happens uh, with the emission from coming from this device and propagating to their propaga and propagating to the grid when we change the impedance of, na of neighboring installations. That means when we change the impedance of the lighting installation. The second experiment addresses how the emission from this lighting installation uh, propagates to the grid and its relation to the grid impedance. So let's start with the first experiment in which we want to study the emission from a, a solar inverter in this case. We want to study this emission and we want to know how sensitive that emission is, how this emission changes when we change the impedance of the lighting installation. So different, different impede, uh, conditions of impedance in the neighboring lighting installation. How do we change the impedance of the lighting installation? Well, just by connecting and disconnecting devices. And just remember that when we, as, as more devices are connected in the lighting installation, the more, lam the more lamps um, the lighting installation has, then the impedance of that lighting installation is lower. Another way we can change the impedance of this lighting installation is to use uh, different, different types of lamps. So for our experiment, we use three types of lamps uh, in, that have different characteristics in the, in, Imp different impedance characteristics as the frequency of interest. So if we look at this impedance plot, we have three types of lamps that at the frequency of interest, which is in, in this case is 16 kilohertz, uh, here have different imp ma impedance magnitude. So we want to know uh, what happens with the emission of the inverter when we change the impedance of the lighting installation, uh, taking into account these different conditions. Now, I want to mention also here that this experiment was made in collaboration with Dresden University of Technology. And uh, the experiment was made actually in their laboratory and the data was analyzed uh, here in Israel So let's see what happens with the emission from the inverter. Here we have a spectrum that shows the emission from the inverter at 16 kilohertz under different conditions. So when the inverter is operating alone and when we have different number of lamps at uh, the la a neighboring lighting installation. Now we want to quantify this emission. And for that matter, we have taking taken this bandwidth from 15.5 uh, to 16.5 and we want to group all the components between these two frequency limits we do that using this simple formula uh, which gives us a value just one value that characterizes the emission 
of the inverter for certain uh, for different conditions and those conditions are that value when um, 10 lamps are operating in the neighboring installation and and 50 lamps when they uh, when for 50 lamps operating in the neighboring lighting installation uh, just remember that uh, different number of lamps mean different impedance in the neighboring lighting installation. So now we want to, to plot this emission uh, characteristic value against the number of lamps. So let's, uh, we do that like this. So we connect different number of lamps in the lighting installation and we measure the emission from the inverter. We quantify it and plot it like this. So now we use this curve, uh, this method of the curve, I'm going to call it, uh, to assess the sensitivity of the emission from the inverter to changes in impedance, uh, in the impedance of neighboring uh, installations. The results look like this. So first, we see an increase in the inverter's emission for all the cases, but that increase is different depending on the, on the type of lamp we are using in the lighting installation. We can relate also this uh, emission, uh, this uh, result with the impedance of the lamp so we see again this impedance plot. We can see that the lamp that has the highest impedance translates into a low, the lowest, the lowest increase in the emission from the inverter. Now this behavior can be modeled using this simple circuit diagram in which this block represents the solar inverter and this block represents the lighting installation in which, as you can see, we are reducing the impedance of that installation when, um, as we increase the number of lamps operating there. This current represents the current propagating, propagating to the lighting installation. And then we plot that current, we simulate that current against the number of lamps then we obtain a curve like this, which is in accordance with our experimental results. So, so far for this experiment, I have talked about the emission from the inverter, but now we want to see what happens with the superharmonics propagated to the lamp and to the grid. So let's use the curve method again for uh, visualizing this and the results uh, look like this. We can see that as the impedance of the lighting installation decreases, we see more superharmonics propagated to the grid, to the lamps, sorry, and less superharmonics propagated to the grid. This behavior depends as well on the type of lamp we are uh, using. That means it depends on the impedance of the lighting installation. Mm. And this can be seen also in these two plots. So for example, let's uh, talk about the superharmonics propagated to the grid. In this case, they uh, remain fairly constant when changing the impedance of the, of the lighting installation. But in this case, they decrease, uh, they decrease significantly from the starting point and in this case, we see mainly an interaction between the inverter and, and the lamps. So most of the, of the superharmonics uh, being emitted by the inverter are propagating mainly to the lamps. The findings for this experiment can be, can be summarized like this. So lower impedance on neighboring devices uh, leads to higher emission of superharmonics. And also lower impedance of neighboring devices means leads to lower propagation of superharmonics into the grid. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the last experiment I want to show you here. And uh, the, in this experiment, we want to see 
what happens with the superharmonics emitted by this lighting installation and propagated to the grid under two different imp uh, grid impedance conditions like this. So let's do again the whole exercise again and quantify the emission uh, from this uh, from this lighting installation. Uh, in this case, we are taking only this band, like, as you can see, 40 to 50 kilohertz, because we have the highest emission there. And uh, we apply the formula to quantify this emission like this. So we have a value that characterizes that emission for a certain number of lamps. And we can create again the curve to be able to, um, to visualize what happens with the superharmonics propagated to the grid under two different impedance, grid impedance conditions. The results look like this. So we have, as you can see, two uh, characteristics of the curve for two uh, different conditions of the grid impedance. Now we uh, want to model this, this behavior uh, using a, a, simple, a simple model like this one. We did, we did this exercise, we tried out um, a more a resistive model for the, for the grid impedance. We tried out an inductive model for the grid impedance and we tried out the capacitive model for the grid impedance. And the best fit was uh, turned out to be the capacitive model for the grid impedance. So we are using it here and consider this uh, the, the emitting device. That means the lamp, and this is uh, also the lamp that, uh, the end lamp we can see. So now we want to see uh, what is the behavior of this emission, this current propagated to the grid. And the expression for that current is like this. We see that it depends on the number of, uh, of emitting devices in the installation. It depends on the internal emission from the, uh, of the emitting device. And it depends also as well on this factor, gamma. Gamma is the ratio between the impedance of the grid and the impedance of the emitting device. Um, and I'm talking about magnitudes here. So now we can relate this gamma to the results we have in, in, the, in the plot in which higher gamma is, relates to this curve and lower gamma relates to, curve, to this curve. So higher gamma is related to a higher capacitance of the, of the emitting device. And now this is still a work in progress, but I want to uh, say as well that this also has some implications. For example, if we look these two curves, we can also notice that we have two maxima of superharmonics emitted, uh, propagated into the grid. And that, uh, and that maximum level depends on gamma which in the end is the, the ratio between the impedance of the grid and the impedance of the device by using this simple model. Uh, finally, the, we can summarize the findings of this experiment as follows. So a capacitive model for the grid impedance is also uh, is also an option and we have to take into uh, uh, that into consideration alternatives are the resistive model or using also an inductive model or um, or a combination of those but the grid impedance is going to change depending on uh, on the location we're measuring it's going to change as well uh, depending on the equipment connected connected to that location, and the grid impedance is not constant on the frequency domain. So it, it on the it, yeah on the frequency domain it changes depending on the frequency. So we have to find the frequency of interest and then find the and then characterize the impedance of the grid at that frequency of interest. Uh, we also saw that 
um, it is possible that a maximum uh, supraharmonic propagation into a grid uh, exists. And we can relate this maximum to a ratio between the grid impedance and the grid uh, and, and the device impedance. This is a work we are and this is the work we are, are continuing to see what what we can extract from that. And now finally, a list of open challenges I can see from this work for uh, for the work uh, from the work on our group. And those are the assessment of superharmonics in different conditions. So considering now non-homogeneous installations, considering background distortion and the supply in the supply voltage voltage, and considering as well secondary emission from all the devices. How does that affect our quantification of an assessment of superharmonics? I see that it is extremely important to characterize the grid impedance. It, as you as you saw for this example examples, impedance is extremely um, important to be able to assess how superharmonics propagate and grid impedance is changing depending on the conditions of location, equipment connected there, and frequency. Also, a big gap I see on, in research and in studies is the study of propagation on medium voltage and high voltage networks. And I think we should uh, contribute more in this, in this regard. Thank you for your attention and I am and I am open for questions. We are open for questions, I guess. Yes, thank you, Angela, for your great presentation. Uh, indeed, there's still a lot of work to do, and I think you already made a very nice contribution to uh, our research on superharmonics. So thank you for this. Thank you for thank your you. presentation. Um, we received a lot of questions. We will not be able to answer all of them, I think, but I will start with a uh, as a question to both Matt and Angela. So Matt, I think you can also turn your webcam on. Yes, thank you. It's a question from uh, Vladimir Chuk. Uh, at first, greetings uh, for Matt and Angela from Eindhoven. I would like to thank you uh, and put a general question on the table regarding simulations of larger systems. So for example, a complete low voltage network. Uh, do power flow based methods seem like a good solution or should we think of alternatives? Uh, or should we limit the study to parts smaller part of the system but what, what do you both or one of you think of that i received a comment like this on uh, from one reviewer some time and i thought yeah that would be a, that could be a good idea to uh, use these models in power flow um, in, in power flow studies but i think that we are not there yet we need more information because um it is highly, high, highly vi variable what we can assess. So we always uh, are going to, for now, I, I see that we are uh, having different results depending on different conditions. We, we need to stand in a more firm ground before, uh, before going into power flow techniques, I think. I, I agree with that one, actually. Um... Power flow methods are basically based on the assumption that you have a fixed uh, flow, fixed amount of power at certain locations. This is clearly not the case here. So I would say classical um, transfer impedance based methods would seem to make more sense until we start understanding more how primary emission is impacted, or actually what Angela called the internal emission. That one, of course, is also impacted by the voltage distortion. And that gets it even more complicated. But with relatively simple methods, like the ones Angela showed, one can get a fairly good description of, of the measurements. But to do that for a whole distribution network, there are a lot of devices in the distribution network, hundreds if not thousands of them. And model all those of them is a bit of a challenge. Indeed, I believe that's a very big challenge of course because that's not really easy determined how it looks like um another question is from shamista from Inexis, the dutch uh, grid operator um it's about uh, do superharmonics cause additional losses in the network and aging of components what do you think shamista congratulations with your paper i saw it on the yesterday by the way <laughs> that's a side 
um, shall I take that one, Angela? Uh, the, the, yes. losses, yeah, yeah. the losses, I think, is not that big. The amount of energy in the superharmonic frequencies is quite small. And actually, you want losses because they're static. So, well, I don't think one should worry about the energy losses due to the superharmonics. But aging of equipment, yes. Uh, capacitors especially don't like it because obviously for them it's a short circuit and at high frequencies the, the Thomas delta, the loss angle of capacitors increases and you get I square R. So you get additional loss of capacitors. So I think that aging is mainly capacitors, possibly cables actually. Angela did some very interesting work on uh, commercial failures of cable insulations. Cable, cable termination. Cable terminations in medium voltage systems uh, because of the stress grading they they manage. Some types of stress grading are very sensitive to to aging uh, when exposed to superharmonics. And uh, insulation insulation systems uh, it is possible, but I um I don't have enough knowledge about all of the insulation system in the cable. Okay, thank you. Another question from Shamisa to you, Angela. Uh, in your experiment, what are the values of the grid impedance? Are they real values? The, the values of the grid impedance in the second experiment, they yes. are con different conditions in the grid. We connected this, uh, we did this, this experiment with different conditions in the low voltage grid. And so we don't have it also depends on how you want to to measure the impedance of the grid. So it it is not it is not trivial, but uh, so we cannot say that this is a certain value of the impedance of the grid. We saw um, we have a a, re a relation between the volt the superharmonic voltage created at that at that point and the superharmonic current injected by the installation and and we see that those relations are different in the two cases but um yeah i would i wouldn't i, I would have to work more to be able to to extract an exact value i cannot say it uh, right now uh Maybe add to this, it might not be obvious to the other listeners, but in our laboratory, we actually have our own low voltage distribution network where we can change cable cross section and cable length. So we're quite flexible in that one. Which obviously in a real network would be much harder to change impedance. Okay, another question is from Helco van den Brom. Uh, it's to both of you, Mata Angela, a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, and he says, Angela, I think you skipped the issue about the characteristics of superharmonics causing problems with other equipment. Uh, to your experience, is it the time or the frequency characteristic? Could you comment on that? It depends on the interference. <laughs> Sometimes it is. It depends on the interference, really. Um, for some, uh, in, for for example, if we look at uh, audible noise, it is the frequency that matters. And that depends on on who is is hearing the noise. Is it a human or is it a dog? And uh, for uh, residual current devices and a malfunction of them, I would say it's more the peak of the residual current that uh, that might contribute to unwanted tripping. Um, about light flickering and their impact of L on LED lamps, it is the time behavior of superharmonics. And if they are non-synchronized uh, with the fundamental voltage, there is a there is a possibility that they can they can make some LED lamps flicker. So it's not the 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 answer is that it's not universal for all the interferences. Every interference has different uh, physics, we can say, and root causes. And uh, yeah, and the characteristics, uh, relevant characteristics of superharmonics causing that in those interferences are different. Okay, 
thank you. Um, then one final question from uh, from Thijs. Uh, how can we and other listeners from the grid operators, EV manufacturers, uh, contribute to the research and what is still needed in your opinion? It's an open question okay. to both of you. Well, the second one is a lot, basically. The position paper I just referred to is just quite good an overview of that. Uh, what I can contribute is I would say measurements and models. Angela, maybe you want to. Now is your chance, your wish list. <laughs> measurements a lot of data i would yeah i would like to see and also reports of reports of interferences it's not yes, that yeah. Mm, yeah. it's not it's not that common to see published reports of of interferences and when you put them in your in your paper then yeah well but this is not published so how do we know that we can believe you basically so more if any of, the, if any of the viewers, listeners has reports on interference due to supermarkets, document it, write a paper about it, and maybe send it to a site next year. That's or a good idea. Tim, or Tim will next year organize another conference on <laughs> interference. We will share you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, I think that this is a very important conclusion indeed. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, and. I think we can use a lot of help uh, with that. Um, for now, Tim, both of you... I have a question to you. Can we get the questions? All of them. You said there were lots of them. Yes, we, might we will... answer uh, the one we or the other in writing. We will uh, log the, pre the remaining questions and send them to you. So yeah. you, you are able to, uh, to answer them directly. Yeah. Okay, both of you. Yeah. Again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, Next at 11, we have a presentation from Jan Meijer uh, from the Technical University Dresden about Super EMI, that's a project working on the standardization of measurements uh, for the super harmonic range. Um, I hope you also uh, to see you there. And for now, uh, thank you and uh, have a nice thank day. You. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.